Good afternoon, everyone. It is my great pleasure organizing Cardio Margin 12th Global Conference here at Tokyo. Before this, we have organized Cardio Margin Conference at Tokyo in 2014. And before that, we organized in 2013 at Obihiro, Hokkaido. And before this, I have been to Okayama in 2006. So it is my fourth visit to Japan. And presently, I am working as Director of Cardiovascular and Thoracic Surgery at Max Hospital Mohali. And my topic for today is Comprehensive Management of Heart Failure Improves Outcomes. I belong to the beautiful hill city Simla, which was the summer capital of India during the British regime. And I did my schooling from St. Edward School, Shimla, and we used to walk every day at least 6 to 8 kilometers to the school. I did my MBBS from IGMC, Shimla, which is again located in the beautiful Himalayas. And again, we used to walk all the way 6 to 8 kilometers every day. And everyone in the city was used to walking a lot. And that was one of the main reason we did not see many patients with coronary artery disease and very few patients had myocardial infarction. Then I shifted to Chandigarh, which is a tri-city and the capital of Punjab and Haryana. And this region has the highest incidence of coronary artery disease among youngsters in India. And there, a lot of young patients come to us with myocardial infarctions. I did my MS in general surgery from PGI MER Chandigarh and thereafter did my MCH also in cardiovascular and thoracic surgery from PGI Chandigarh. And after that, I continued to work at PGI as assistant professor until I shifted to Fortis Hospital Mohali, where I worked for the next 13 years which is a corporate private hospital and Fortis Healthcare has a chain of more than 80 hospitals all over India. But that Fortis Mohali was the first Fortis hospital to start in 2001. And when I left Fortis, I joined Max as Director of Cardiovascular and Thoracic Surgery in 2014. In between, I had the opportunity to work as executive director in IV Healthcare, which is also located in Punjab and they have seven hospitals located all over Punjab. And I used to head the cardiac sciences in all those hospitals. And Punjab has got the highest incidence of heart attacks among youngsters. I had the opportunity to go to University of Maryland in USA and there Dr. Jonas Bonatti uh, he was the president of Robotic Society and every day they used to perform total endoscopic coronary artery bypass surgeries uh, at least two in a day and they were doing a lot of hybrid procedures and advanced coronary interventions. Thereafter, I also got the opportunity to go to Seattle in Swedish hospital where Dr. Eric was doing a lot of complicated procedures and also they were doing robotic surgery as well as minimally invasive cardiac surgery and a large number of IV procedures, the percutaneous aortic valve implantations. In 2015, I had the opportunity to visit Leipzig Heart Center in Germany where every day 28 to 30 surgeries were performed and there were separate operation theater where seven to eight TAVI procedures were performed every day. And there were seven other operation theaters in which a variety of cardiac surgery were performed every day, including pediatric surgery, adult cardiac surgery, as well as transplant surgeries. I attended various workshops in, at Singapore and Bangkok on video assisted thoracic surgery endovascular surgery and stem cell implantation as well as valve repair to update my skills in the various fields of cardiovascular surgery which was rapidly advancing. 
During the first decade, as a practicing cardiac surgeon, I constantly felt that we need to have a team approach for management of the various complex cardiovascular problems. And therefore, we started the global group called Cardio Merger in 2011, which is now a trust. And the purpose of starting this was to spread integrated approach for the management of cardiovascular and thoracic diseases in a comprehensive and cost effective manner. And thereafter, we have been organizing cardiomergen conferences across the globe every year. The first one was organized at my native city, Chandigarh, in India, and it had a participation of 400 delegates from 22 countries. And there were 46 reputed speakers from across the globe and there were 55 speakers from India. And the response to this conference was uh, tremendous and they compelled us that we should uh, perform such conferences across the globe every year because there was a lot of diversity in the management of cardiovascular patients in different countries across the globe and there was a need for acquiring uniformity in the management of such patients so therefore every year we organize such conferences to ensure that uh, everyone uh, is updated and everyone gets an opportunity to refine their skills so that the management of cardiovascular disease remains similar anywhere across the globe cardiovascular diseases are responsible for 30 percent of the mortalities across the globe every year and even in india cardiovascular disease they are on the rise and india is now the coronary capital of the world with the highest mortalities because of a myocardial infarction uh, followed by respiratory diseases. There has been a sudden increase in the cardiovascular complications after the onset of the COVID pandemic. And it has been seen in many studies that the incidence of heart attacks also increases several fold after the onset of COVID. It was seen that there was an almost 14% increase in the rise of fatal heart attacks in the first year of COVID pandemic and which increased to almost 29.9% increase in the fatal heart attacks, especially among youngsters 25 to 44 years of age. And it was seen that the incidence of thromboembolic complications as well as heart failure, stroke and arrhythmias, including death, was much higher in those patients who required hospitalization for COVID compared to those patients who did not require hospitalization, but still there was a significant increase in the cardiovascular complications, especially the thromboembolic complications in those patients who had a mild form of COVID and did not require hospitalization. There has also been a constant increase in the heart failure patients across the globe. And it has been seen that most of the patients of heart failure, they reside in the Asian countries, especially India, which has the highest burden of heart failure patients. It is estimated that there are around 21 million adult patients worldwide having heart failure. And this number is constantly rising. And the patients require re-hospitalization and heart failure is the number one cause of hospitalization for those patients who are above 65 years of age. Almost 50% patients, they die within five years from the diagnosis of heart failure. And a lot of patients, they have uh, various comorbidities and heart failure patients usually have more than three comorbidities. And it has increased the economic burden over the globe, it is estimated that $108 billion they are spent on the management of heart failure. In India, heart failure has been growing like a silent epidemic and the mortality rate is also very high among Indian population. They are affected at a much younger age 
the one year mortality is estimated to be around 31% and three year mortality around 45% and it is estimated that almost 60% of the patients they die within 5 years the prevalence of heart failure is about 1% of the total indian population in india the major burden of the heart failure patient is because of the delayed treatment post myocardial infarction around 10 to 40% of the individuals after myocardial infarction in india develop heart failure and among the prevalence of 8 to 10 million heart failure patients in india almost 4 to 5 million patients are because of delayed treatment for myocardial infarction heart failure is a much bigger challenge in india compared to the western population it has been seen that the mean age of heart failure population in the west is 73 years whereas in india it is 53 years the in hospital mortality in the western country is 3.8% whereas indian population it is almost 30% which is 10 times higher and also the post discharge mortality within 6 months is 8.6% in the western population whereas in the indian population it is 26.3% which is almost 3 times higher and it has been also seen that the one year mortality is also higher among indian population the incidence of diabetes mellitus is also higher in the indian population and the indian patients they are much younger and ischemic heart failure is the major contributor and they have a worse prognosis compared to the western population while delayed treatment of coronary artery disease is the main cause of heart failure in indian population other causes include valvular heart disease pericardial disease high output states volume overloads because of renal failure and congenital heart disease endocardial disease as well as arrhythmias and conduction disorders heart failure is associated with various comorbidities and these comorbidities have a impact on the prognosis of the patients with heart failure these comorbidities include copd hypertension angina renal dysfunction diabetes mellitus anemia cachexia obesity gout hyperlipidemia iron deficiency depression and sleep disturbances and many patients of heart failure also have various cancers so all these comorbidities they have a major impact in the management because uh, some drugs used to treat the comorbidities may also worsen the heart failure whereas those drugs used to treat heart failure may worsen the comorbidities the ha classification has divided heart failure into four stages in stage a it includes the high risk patients who are likely to develop heart failure these are the patients with hypertension coronary artery disease diabetes mellitus and those with family history of cardiomyopathy in stage b are patients who are asymptomatic but have heart failure these include those patients who had a previous mi those who have lv systolic dysfunction and those who have asymptomatic valvular heart disease in stage c comes the those patients who have symptomatic heart failure and they are known to have structural heart changes and also uh, they have shortness of breath and fatigue and they have reduced exercise tolerance in stage d are those patients who are in the end stage of heart failure and have refractory disease and these patients have marked symptoms at rest despite maximal medical management so once the diagnosis of heart failure is established then the gradually uh, worsening of the symptoms occurs from one stage to the next a significant number of those patients who develop acute coronary syndromes uh, have st elevation mi and many of them they can develop hemodynamic instability as well as cardiogenic shock acute coronary syndrome a dire emergency and every minute is crucial and a delay of each minute reduces several days of life span of the patient and what is known as time is muscle and muscle is time is very true because 
if we open up the artery within the first hour which is also known as a golden hour then the risk of irreversible damage to the myocardium will be minimum so many times patient they miss the symptoms of uh, acute coronary syndrome and mistake it for dyspepsia or sometimes they uh, take antacids sometimes they delay the treatment or take muscular painkillers and many times uh, they go to unconventional therapies and because of this there is a delay in the initiation of the treatment after acute coronary syndrome onset during the golden hour the patient should be immediately rushed to the nearest cardiac center where the patient should undergo immediate emergency ptca to open up the artery which has been blocked and the door to balloon time should be less than 1 hour however some patients they are located at places which are far off from the nearest cardiac center and it may take several hours for them to reach the nearest cardiac center so it is advisable that before shifting the patient they should stabilize the patient and they should thrombolize the patient so that it will give them some extra hours and once they are stabilized then they should be shifted safely to the nearest cardiac center otherwise what mistake most of the people do is that they shift the patient immediately and the patient may die on the way the injury to the myocytes which occurs due to myocardial infarction causes ventricular remodeling and which can lead to electrical instability and reduction in the ejection fraction and this can uh, cause neurohormonal imbalances which are mainly uh, due to the renin angiotensin and aldosterone system as well as the sympathetic nervous system which may further lead to further myocardial injury whereas the third system affected is the natriuretic peptide system which has a balancing effect and a protective function the risk of cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization also increases significantly with the decrease in the left ventricular ejection fraction even a 10% reduction in the left ventricular ejection fraction can increase the cardiovascular death or chronic heart failure hospitalization by 45% and the risk of cardiovascular death by 57% the risk of heart failure hospitalization or death also increases significantly with the increase in left ventricular and diastolic volume as well as the left ventricular and systolic volume a 10 ml increase in the left ventricular and diastolic volume can increase death or hospitalization due to heart failure rate increases by 9% and also a 10 ml increase in left ventricular and systolic volume increases death or heart failure hospitalization rate by 15% heart failure is a silently progressive disease in the stage a and stage b prevention plays a very vital role and with proper prevention we can delay the progression into the stage c and stage c uh, needs a very aggressive treatment of heart failure otherwise there are rapid exacerbation of failure symptoms and gradually and the patient progresses into stage d and ultimately death heart failure is a progressive condition in which the quality of life progressively worsens and the mortality risk progressively worsens so ultimately the patient will have a bad quality of life repeated hospitalizations and then the patient dies even after revascularization most of the patients they have a higher risk of death and almost 2 out of 10 patients they may have sudden death anti pro bnp as well as echocardiography they play a vital role in the diagnosis of heart failure and based on the echocardiographic findings especially the left ventricular ejection fraction heart failure has been classified into heart failure with preserved ejection fraction in those patients who have a ejection fraction above 50% heart failure with moderately reduced ejection fraction that is between 41 to 49% and heart failure with reduced ejection fraction which is below 40% the composite rate of death stroke as well as mi at 3 years 
after onset of heart failure was seen to be significantly higher in those patients who have a reduced ejection fraction compared to those patients who have a preserved ejection fraction unfortunately most of the times we had been practicing the intervention based medical management program as well as surgical programs because of the late presentation of the patient to us only when they required an intervention and before the onset of complications usually the patient they never report to the hospital whereas the preventive as well as the initial medical management part have been totally ignored and because of that most of the patient come to us with heart failure by the time they reach the hospital most of the patient they have confusions after the onset of acute coronary syndrome whether they should go for medical management or whether they should go for percutaneous interventions or whether they should go for bypass and lot of time is wasted because of that and many times the doctors also are confused and because there is lack of team approach so the general guideline is that if there are multiple artery blockages and if the patient is having some lv dysfunction and if the patient is diabetic then the best treatment would be a coronary artery bypass surgery otherwise if the patient has uh, less number of blockages and if the patient is not having frank heart failure or low ejection fraction then maybe a percutaneous intervention could be equally good although there have been tremendous improvement in the medical management of the patient with acute mi and heart failure and also the guideline directed medical therapy has improved a lot in the last decade because of the use of ac inhibitors beta blockers mra arb and evabradin uh, yet the, if medical management is the only treatment adopted then the mortality will be very high uh, more than 20% it has been seen that the risk of mortality and heart failure hospitalization remains high in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction even after percutaneous interventions as well as uh, cabg it has been seen that the 30 day outcomes in patients who underwent percutaneous intervention were slightly worse than those patients who had cabg and it was also seen that even after 3 years the comparison was similar that the outcome was worse in percutaneous interventions compared to cabg patients so therefore cabg is the recommended treatment of choice in those patients who have reduced ejection fraction after acute myocardial infarction with multi vessel disease recent european guidelines also advise cabg as the first choice of revascularization strategy in patients with multi vessel disease an acceptable surgical risk to improve their prognosis in the scenario of left ventricular dysfunction at the same time guideline directed medical therapy has also consolidated its position as the cornerstone of heart failure therapy after coronary artery bypass and it is well understood that medical and surgical options are not competitors but rather they are complementary strategies which should be adopted despite improvement in medical therapies and surgical techniques the management of patients with coronary artery disease with low ejection fraction is still challenging this is because with an ejection fraction of 21 to 30% the risk of hospital mortality for conventional cabg almost doubles and it was seen that if the surgery is performed off pump on beating heart then the risk of mortality as well as morbidity post operatively is quite low 25 years ago we used to perform bypass on pump in the conventional way and whenever we used to face patients with severe damage to the lv myocardium and the patient especially when they were hemodynamically not stable then we used to put them on cardiopulmonary bypass and perform the surgery on uh, empty beating heart without giving cardioplegia however for the last 15 years we have been performing 
the surgeries on beating heart even in those patients who are hemodynamically unstable we insert the intraiotic balloon pump and then even on high inotropic support we do the surgery on beating heart uh, with very good results and here you can see this patient has a severe myocardial infarction of the anterior wall and the patient came with cardiogenic shock so ibp was inserted and after that here you can see that uh, bypass is being performed and uh, we have to make sure that we don't keep the octopus stabilizer very near to the infarcted zone because if it is kept near to the infarcted zone there is a risk of myocardial rupture during performing the surgery and also here you can see that this is the anterior wall of the left ventricle which is hardly moving and here you can see the right ventricular wall which is contracting and this is the graft distal anastomosis being done to the led and uh, the led was completely occluded and here you can see uh, after revascularization then the other grafts to the posterior descending artery and the left circumflex artery were also performed and the patient went home on the fifth post operative day and uh, then we follow up the patient uh, performing the echocardiography after 3 months and 12 months and many of them they have a very remarkable recovery of the ejection fraction and even in the quality of life and in many patients even with low ejection fraction of almost 15% the ejection fraction is restored to more than 50% uh, many times and that depends on how much viable myocardium is there we retrospectively compared our data uh, and compared the patients uh, who were operated before 2011 um, when we were not uh, adopting the comprehensive management strategy and we compared the results of those patients with the results that were seen after we started the integrated approach uh, to comprehensively manage those patients with acute coronary syndromes and heart failure and we also optimized the guideline directed medical therapy in these patients and adopted the team approach so here you can see number of patients were 1091 in group a that was before comprehensive management was started and it was uh, 1263 in those patients in whom comprehensive management was started and it was seen that the number of patients who had cardiogenic shock they were more in the group a patients before comprehensive management was started and it was less comparatively in group b and also it was seen that the more number of patients required to be put on pump and required perfusion assisted coronary artery bypass whereas very negligible number of patients in group b they required to be put on pump only when there was intractable arrhythmia or there was a ventricular rupture then only we put them on pump in rest of the cases we performed the surgery on beating heart of pump it was also seen that uh, the patients uh, who had pre operative ventricular arrhythmias were more in group a the patients who had acute renal failure were also more in group a and also more patients required hemodialysis in group a so the incidence of these complications was also less after uh, we started comprehensive management the incidence of those patients requiring mitral valve surgery replacement or repair were more before comprehensive management was started and also those patients who required uh, ventricular septal defect closure were also seen in group a before comprehensive management was started and it was not seen in those patients who had comprehensive management and timely medical therapy as well as 
team approach was adopted to prevent the complications so it was seen that early off pump coronary artery bypass in acute coronary syndrome is a very safe procedure and it improves the left ventricular function if the myocardium is viable and if there is a adequate amount of hibernating myocardium then subsequently there is a improvement in the left ventricular function and also it was seen that the benefits are limited by the time interval between the onset of myocardial infarction or acute coronary syndrome and the revascularization and it was also seen that it also depends on the size of the infarct it was also seen that in group a patients total 8.9% of the patient required intraaortic balloon pump to be inserted among them most of the patients 6.5% they required balloon pump insertion before the patient was taken up for surgery and 1.9% required while the patient was being operated and only 0.4% patient they required after the surgery was over and it was seen that almost 1.5% of the patient they required conversion to pump whereas in the group b after we started the comprehensive management it was seen that only 2.2% of the patient they required uh, intraaortic balloon pump only 0.8% required before surgery 1% required during surgery when the pa pressure started rising suddenly and the patient became hemodynamically unstable and also it was seen that in the post operative very negligible number of patients they required ibp insertion when the patient was not doing hemodynamically well even after complete revascularization and the conversion to pump was very negligible only in 0.2% of the patients if we compare the comorbidities it was seen that the mean age was becoming lesser over the years and in group b it was 54.7 years whereas it was 60.95 years in group a the incidence of hypertension and diabetes was almost similar in both the groups and also the incidence of triple vessel disease was also similar in both the groups the incidence of left main disease was more prevalent in group b whereas the incidence of renal dysfunction was almost equal in both the groups it was seen that the time lapsed after the onset of myocardial infarction and by the time the patient came to us for cabg was more than 8 to 72 hours in most of the patients it was even more in patients who reported after 3 days to 1 week and very few patients reached within 8 hours and many patients they came after 1 week it was also seen that the troponin level was elevated in most of the patients and in some patient it was elevated more than 50 nanogram per deciliter it was also seen that more the time you last after the onset of acute coronary syndrome the less the ejection fraction was and also the higher the troponin i levels the coronary arteries with significant disease in all the viable territories were grafted and the mean number of graft in most of the patient was 3 and it was seen that only few patients required just one graft and some of the patient they required up to six grafts in group a patients those who had aneurysmal left ventricular aneurysms some of them they had ventricular restoration procedure but later on in the group b none of the patient had ventricular restoration procedure here you can see the left ventricular aneurysm it is stuck to the pericardium and in these patients we just revascularize the patient which was the recommendation after the stitch trial so all the patient just had myocardial revascularization by coronary artery bypass performed on beating heart and the outcome was much better the post operative ventilation time the icu stay and the hospital stay were longer in those patients who had a left ventricular ejection fraction of less than 20% after acute coronary syndromes and also it was seen that the post operative 
improvement in the left ventricular ejection fraction was 10.6% in group A, whereas it was 14.4% in group B. And the myocardial function improved over a period of time. And we performed the echocardiography three months after surgery and 12 months after surgery. And it was seen that uh, the mitral regurgitation regressed in 60% of the patients in group A, whereas it regressed in 84% of the patient in group B. It worsened in 6% of the patients in group A, while there was no worsening in those patients who were in group B. The overall ICU stay and hospital stay was less in group B patients and most of the time it ranged between 3 to 5 days. The post-operative complication was also lower in group B patients. Those patients who required hemodialysis were 2.9% in group A while only 1.6% required hemodialysis in group B. Also the incidence of stroke was 4 in group A while it was only 1 in group B. Mortality was 0.9%. Uh, the mortality among patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction was 1.74% in group A, while it was only 0.7% in group B. And in those patients who had acute coronary syndromes with uh, cardiogenic shock, it was 11.3% in group A, while it was less 8.3% in group B. It was overall seen that off-pump bypass surgery performed well in time. It reduces the morbidity as well as the mortality risk in the patients who had reduced ejection fractions. It was also seen that composite rate of death, stroke and MI at 3 years was slightly higher in those patients who had uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction but guideline directed medical therapy was seen to improve the clinical outcome uh, not only after one month but also after five years and there was a 36 percent reduction in the death rate as well as a 23 percent reduction in the overall death myocardial infarction and cva rates Apart from using the guideline directed medical therapy and comprehensive management of the patients, we also adapted the advances in technology like uh, the endoscopic vein harvesting procedures uh, for harvesting the conduits uh, during uh, the off pump surgery. And uh, this also helped in the early recovery uh, in the post operative period. The somehow not uh, give as much uh, better long term results. Uh, therefore, uh, although I visited uh, Dr. Bonatti in the University of Maryland almost 15 years ago, uh, we could not uh, uh, start, initiate the robotic uh, coronary revascularization program uh, because most of the centers who were performing uh, the revascularization. Uh, by voting technique, they also uh, one by one abandoned performing the techniques and are no longer performing the techniques mainly because of the very long uh, learning curve as well as the very high cost and we could not see much benefit because uh, the long term results were much better obtained with the open surgery that we were performing. And uh, most of the uh, patients uh, they were discharged uh, in the third post operative day, the fifth post operative day. Uh, so, the uh, outcome surgery was found to be much more cost effective compared to robotic surgery. Therefore, we continue to perform outcome surgery in all our patients. We have been constantly performing the endovascular aortic aneurysm repairs uh, for thoracic as well as arch aneurysms uh, with very good promising uh, overall results and, uh, and the entire procedure just takes less than one hour to perform and uh, with very few uh, patients having any significant uh, complications and the overall results are very good.
we have been also performing the TAVI procedure uh, for those patients who had aortic stenosis and they were elderly and having a lot of comorbidities including old age, heart failure and other complications like renal complications and overall uh, the results are very encouraging and patients uh, had a very early recovery and they were discharged within a couple of days after performing the procedure. Then there is a group of patients who cannot be dealt with these techniques that we have discussed uh, who require cardiac transplant. So it has been seen that uh, majority of the transplant programs they are performed either in North America or in Europe and nowadays even in India there has been a rise in the heart transplants however but uh, the overall volume of the patients requiring a heart transplant they are much higher than the available donor hearts. So previously only a brain death was considered the criteria for uh, having a donor heart uh, but recently there has been uh, a rapid rise in acceptance for uh, those patients who had circulatory arrest and because of this the number of transplant has steadily increased in the last few years however in India it is still uh, yet to be accepted other options like ventricular assist devices and the artificial heart are still not very popular in India because of the enormous cost and a lot of patients who are waiting for transplant cannot afford to have these options. However, we have been frequently performing cardiac resynchronization in those patients who, who had heart failure uh, with low ejection fraction below 35% and uh, having a wide QRS and we have seen very encouraging results and also this is much more affordable and it is a good option for patients who have heart failure with conduction delay and by sequentially pacing the right and left ventricular we can improve the left ventricular ejection fraction to a significant extent. Stem cell and regenerative therapy has been holding the interest of clinicians across the globe for more than two decades now. However, despite uh, encouraging results, uh, there are a lot of issues which are still to be tackled. And it was seen that the overall survival of the stem cell was quite low and the dwell time was very less. And most of the cells, almost 70% of the cells, they die within 48 hours uh, because uh, the infected muscle does not have any source of nutrition or blood supply. And also, it is difficult to obtain the stem cells at the target uh, infected muscle. Nowadays, it has been seen that most of the effects uh, of the stem cell they they are because of the uh, paracrine effects rather than the cardiomyocyte proliferation. Therefore, uh, nowadays the interest has shifted towards the use of extracellular vesicles and exosomes for performing the same function that the stem cells uh, would have done. So, with this, uh, there is uh, less ethical issues and also uh, there is no uh, elaborate issues of uh, uh, cell culturing and uh, scaffolding and all those things. So maybe if we can use the extracellular vesicles uh, with the messenger RNA who can perform the same function and uh, induce cardiomyocyte proliferation as well as uh, angiogenesis and uh, which could replicate the desired effect. Uh, but then the result it should also generate cardiomyocytes which can perform the same contractile function as well as the electrical function of the original cardiomyocyte. We have also encountered various challenges in the medical management of heart failure patients. 
who have a reduced ejection fraction and most important is the hyperkalemia because it has been seen that the patients who are put on guideline directed medical therapy they usually uh, can come to us with hyperkalemia which may require holding of the these drugs or reducing their doses uh, which can actually precipitate the heart failure and may worsen the situation heart failure along with the hyperkalemia remains an unresolved issue and it has been seen that patients with heart failure have recurrent hyperkalemia episodes which continue to occur in successively uh, shorter time durations between each episode until the patient finally uh, succumbs to the disease it has been seen that persistent hyperkalemia and acute heart failure patients was associated with a much higher risk of mortality compared to those patients who achieved or maintained normal kalemia so the risk was higher higher in even those patients who had hypokalemia and the risk was higher in those patients who had hyperkalemia nowadays sglt2 inhibitors they are becoming quite popular because uh, they have reduced the heart failure and renal decline through multiple mechanisms which are mainly uh, induced by type 2 diabetes uh, which include sodium retention hyperkalemia ras activation neurohormonal activation inflammation ischemia and altered energetics various studies have shown that SGLT2 inhibitors they reduce worsening of heart failure they reduce the first worsening of the heart failure event they reduce the death from cardiovascular causes and also reduce death from any other causes ivabradin also reduces the cardiovascular death as well as hospitalization for worsening heart failure in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction the most important drug we have been using extensively for over 5 years now is the sacobitril versartan combination popularly known as arni and because of its endogenous vasoactive peptide effects and decrease in the neurohormonal activation vascular tone cardiac fibrosis Uh, hypertrophy as well as sodium retention this drug has produced tremendous improvement in the management of patients with uh, ischemic heart failure in our own experience we have seen tremendous reduction in the cardiovascular death rate as well as the hospitalization rate in those patients uh, who have been put on arni in our own uh, patients before surgery or even after surgery uh, we have been using arni uh, since more than 5 years now and we have seen that uh, though we have to optimize the dose and all patients may not be able to tolerate the dose of 50 mg twice a day so we have to start with the lower dose and then gradually titrate the dose uh, so that they can tolerate 50 mg twice a day and maybe we gradually step it up to up to 100 mg twice a day but Uh, we have seen that uh, in those patients who, who have a low ejection fraction with borderline uh, blood pressures and uh, significant mitral regurgitation to the extent of severe mitral regurgitation many times put the patient on arni and optimize the guideline directed medical therapy and uh, try to reduce the mitral regurgitation up to at least moderate regurgitation and then Uh, we take the patient for surgery but uh, in the immediate perioperative period we have to hold arni and because uh, we have to use uh, some drug with a shorter duration of action and then uh, later on once the patient has recovered after surgery and is off inotropes then maybe before discharge we can uh, again restart arni and then optimize the dose before sending the patient back home apart from the composite of death and heart failure readmissions there was also a reduction of around 16% in the left ventricular assist device need and also the listing for cardiac transplant with the use of arni 24 hours within admission in patients who had 
heart failure with reduced ejection fraction in our own experience we have seen not only a better improvement in the left ventricular ejection fraction in the post operative period in those patients who have been put on arni uh, but we have also seen that the left ventricular and diastolic and left ventricular and systolic volumes also uh, drastically reduce in these patients who are put on arni after surgery so i would like to summarize that uh, once we initiate sacubital versartan uh, it should be done uh, in hospital preferably uh, before discharge and we have seen that there is not only the improvement in left ventricular ejection fraction there is also uh, improvement in the cardiac structural changes and also reduction in the mortality of the patients and also reduction in the risk of rehospitalizations and there is a drastic reduction in the mitral regurgitation as well it is for this reason that most of the european and american guidelines have included arni as the class 1 indication for the management of patients with heart failure uh, especially in the reduced ejection fraction category so for the heart failure guidelines and the four pillars of the guideline directed medical therapy for patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and that is below 40% and symptomatic the four pillars are arni beta blockers mra and sglt2 inhibitors apart from that ivabradin is considered in those who have a heart rate more than 70 beats per minute and sinus rhythm and also Uh, one drug which has come up for recent heart failure hospitalization is very sigvat apart from that we have to educate the patient for self care and exercise and we have to treat the comorbidities like uh, atrial fibrillation functional mr has to be treated and then iron deficiency chronic uh, kidney disease and diabetes mellitus the all of them have to be adequately treated also we have to uh, give diuretics according uh, to the uh, patient's requirement uh, like we have to decongest the patient only so that the patient uh, maintains euvolemia and we have not to use excess of uh, diuretics so that the patient becomes hypovolemic various regimes have been described for initiation of the guideline directed medical therapy and optimization uh, these include the conventional stepped approach in which uh, the drugs are initiated one by one uh, like the ace inhibitors and then beta blockers then mra then arni and sglt2 inhibitors but nowadays uh, we prefer to initiate multiple drugs um, in the first step and then gradually optimize their doses and then add more drug if still we cannot attain the uh, patient uh, optimization and then uh, there is also other rapid sequencing methods in which all three steps are completed within 4 weeks and there is the simultaneous initiation and rapid titration method in which multiple drugs are started and rapidly we achieve the optimization once again i would like to reemphasize that instead of the intervention based approach we should uh, start the integrated approach for the comprehensive management of heart failure as well as uh, coronary artery disease and we should start from primordial prevention and then continue till primary prevention early diagnosis the stage of medical management and we should try to prevent the need for interventions if we control the disease progression adequately however if required we should do the intervention which is best for the patient uh, adopting the uh, team approach and then we should give proper rehabilitation to the patient and then we should continue the secondary prevention so that the patient doesn't have early Uh, recurrence of the disease and remains uh, healthy 
uh, as well as uh, has a longer lifespan and a longer health span.